I invited Kerr to uh, join him up here for a fireside chat on network transformation because he represents the ultimate customer of what we're all talking about, which is an enterprise that uses telco services to do its daily business. So, and I, I've gotten to know him through, through MEF. He's on the Enterprise Advisory Council. He's been on some other panels. Um, he, uh, he speaks from the heart and he tells us what we need to hear, we being sort of the, the telecom community. Um, now that this is a perfect venue discussing network transformation in all of its dimensions, we should have him come here and share some of this. So I've sent him some questions. He sent me some things he wanted to talk about and uh, hopefully we'll have a, a good and enlightening discussion uh, without slides. Decided to forego slides and he'll have to describe what he would have shown on slides in words, but in ways that represent the context of network transformation as we've talked about it now for two and a half days. So um, I would like to start by asking Herod sort of what his job is and how, how you got into this. Sure, so I'm, I'm a network architect for Microsoft IT and that means that we are responsible for the connectivity between the 512 or so offices where Microsoft employees work from. Right? So that also means that in, I'm not part of the business side like Azure, we're not responsible for the Azure network, we're not responsible for the Xbox network, but we're really responsible for the network that interconnects the offices that an FTE connects to to do its job, right? And that I, I wrote down a couple of the figures, they obviously service providers are used to a large, large scales, uh, but we have about 144,000 FTEs. Uh, I mentioned already 512 sites, 40% of those are engineers or part of the engineering community, like we say. Um, we are geographically, the, the emphasis is obviously in Redmond. There's about uh, 47,000 people in Redmond, and that's the majority of the engineering community too. Um, on the network, we do have, i just describe a little bit about the network, and then i go back to how I got into this. Um, we looked at, uh, or we're looking at uh, 350,000 uh, Windows machines and Mac, MacBooks. Um, we actually, have MacBooks. In we do have MacBooks at Microsoft because, as you know, everybody, a lot of people on the MacBook use Office. So the first people that got a MacBook were the people that are developing Office for Mac because mm -hmm. you have to eat your own dog food, right? So that's the perfect way to learn it. But no, we do have MacBooks. Um, we have about 14 million calls per month on the network, uh, of which 1 million conference calls that are running over that. And that makes the, the 1 million conference call makes up about 90% of the minutes of total voice on the network. Does this relate to Skype or is this independent of Skype as a service? It's, uh, it's mostly Skype and Teams calls. Right? So that's obviously what it is. So Microsoft yeah. Teams, we, yes. we use that in MEF. Yeah, 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 exactly. So my, my background, a little bit of how I got into this. So I was one of the um, one of the people that just like a lot of oh, a lot of people in the industry worked for Cisco for a long time, uh, and then I worked for Cisco IT. I worked in the services organization, and in 2014, um, I went to Microsoft because of a personal relationship with uh, some of the people. Um, we got into when I joined Microsoft. It's it's we were definitely not at the same level of Azure. We were a bunch of High skilled engineers, I heard the terminology CCA level engineers earlier this week, a bunch of keyboard jockeys that do extremely well in upgrading 500 routers manually over the course of a weekend. So Microsoft typically is a software company. They had been neglecting, I think, to a certain extent, some of the hardware. Um, so that kind of meant that we were not the most advanced organization. And I still look at it. I think today we are still not one of the most advanced IT organizations, but this some good progress and I think there's a, there's a good way going forward. Uh, and it's actually in that perspective that I also got involved uh, via the CTO from MEF. I got involved with uh, some of the intent-based networking stuff, some of the SDN, NFV, et cetera. So that's how I came to where I sit today on this chair, I guess. Okay, so you mentioned the CTO of Microsoft. What are the responsibilities of a Microsoft CTO? So he is, <coughs> sorry, so he had, or he has responsibility over the infrastructure. That means the network I just described uh, that connects all the 500 offices. He had responsibility for all the on-premise hosting, including the on-premise data centers. Um, and he had responsibility for all the line of business applications that IT develops for the different uh, parts of Microsoft. 
Okay, so it's really the internal operation of Microsoft Correct. as an enterprise. Yes, exactly. So again, it's separate from Azure, yes. Skype for Business. Yes. They have their, obviously they have their own CTO and um, so it's... Uh, okay, so this is a major enterprise. 500 locations, 150,000 employees, uh, and a lot of information-based business, which is what, what you do. So yeah. that's why it's a great candidate to talk about network transformation, why it's a great customer uh, example for in, in MEF and, and the work that we do. So um, can you describe basically what the Microsoft IT network looks like today? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty traditional model, I think. I, by the way, we're going to have a lot of time. The timer didn't start yet. We're <laughs> the, gonna be talking the timer about. is not moving. That's okay. We'll, we'll keep going till 6 p.m. That's okay. <laughs> um, so we are a relatively <coughs> traditional hub, hub spoke and core connectivity. So I can categorize the offices. Let's say when I joined, and I'll talk about mm -hmm. the transformation we've been going through the last two years or so in a couple of minutes. We have, I would say, roughly five types of offices. Internet connected offices, ICO1, which is like you own your own. There's probably like two, three people starting a new location. ICO is internet connected Connect only? Yes, office. Internet connected, connected office. office. But it's actually, it's an internet only connection, yes. Then we have ICO2 offices. They have a hardware VPN. So we put a concentrator and then we put a, another device at the site and we are responsible for making that connection through the internet. Then we have a ton of remote sites, which is the typical sales and marketing offices, right? They're typically between a 50 and a couple of hundred people. Uh, we have a lot of those. They get normally connected via MPLS, and they connect all back to certain hub sites. Sure. You can't hear me? Is my microphone not working? Sorry, say it again. Well, He's just yeah, remote sort of offices. Yeah, those are like uh, the small offices. I don't know what's a matter of speaking up, or can the microphone be turned up? The microphone guy's behind you, Alan. Yeah, can you turn up the microphone? Can you turn up the volume a little bit, this question, please? Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the remote sales offices typically connect to a hub site. Um, I'll take the example. Well, it's, it's mostly regional, right? So all the sites in Germany, for example, they connect back to Munich, which is a hub. And then those hubs connect back to some of the core sites. And those core sites typically... Because we are Microsoft, they are on the same locations as Azure is, because for backbone connectivity, we have our own backbone, but we use a lot of the connectivity from Azure that Azure builds proprietary for them, which is, like I said, we separate from Azure, but we still use some of their connectivity, as a, not really as a customer, but as a partner more, because they have their own fibers and stuff, so we use part of that. Ah, so I was thinking you're sort of a customer of the mm -hmm. Azure infrastructure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just the backbone, yeah, yeah, for the lot. So for the remote, like the, the smaller sales offices, the hub locations in general, we use carry MPLS, so we buy MPLS, or we use a lease line and have our own MPLS connectivity. Those are normally from, I mean, most of our, most of the people of vendors are in the room here, right? So all the names that we see here, mm -hmm. uh, we don't we don't have a single vendor. We have multiple depending on the region. Uh, so you say depending on the region. So who makes the decisions in MSIT? about the technologies you deploy. So nobody has to buy me dinner tonight because I don't make any decisions. So, right. uh, so there's an RFP <laughs> that goes out and then based on requirements, we get some responses and that's once every five, six years or so that that goes out. But that's, we have a separate carrier strategies team um, that deals with those type of scenarios. And how, how, how does it differ region by region then? How can that happen? Oh, like for example, we have typically Latin America's theater, which is North America, Canada. Um, EMEA, well, Europe, Western Europe, Middle East, and then APAC, we split in General Sydney and Singapore, that side, Hyderabad separately, and then the rest of APAC. So it's mostly per region. And why do they buy things differently per region? <coughs> because more, maybe because of price, maybe because of the functionalities, but sometimes we try to also see where our applications are, which carrier can map the best on top of that. So okay. we put our network map on top of the network map of the carrier, and we see <coughs> this makes sense, yes or no. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so let's talk a little bit about the carrier, pro carrier procurement, carrier relationships, the services you get, you have been getting from carriers. So, yes, yeah, so we have been, in general, most common has been that we bought MPLS services, um, and that's actually, well, actually, it's not changing right now, but we're kind of moving the users into another 
this is actually part of the network transformation. So we're kind of moving the users away to an in, to internet segments right now, right? But that, that's maybe not what you wanted to talk about. Well, I wanted to understand your, your current sort of carrier infrastructure. Um. Um, so it, it's, you mean which, which carriers we use? You don't have to be specific, but you, the extent, the, the type of services, you mentioned MPLS, how pervasive is that? Does it go to the IC, it doesn't go to the ICOs. But no, where, no, no, ICOs where, where are does just it go? internet just connectivity. Internet, yeah. So carrier MPLS or MPLS in general goes to all the sales offices and to the hub sites. Right. And that's like, that we, today we just buy plain connectivity. We don't have any much additional services on that except for some reporting and so on. It's not that we buy any of NRV solutions or some of that. Okay. It's, not, it's not what we're doing today. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and without giving numbers, how much of that is there in Microsoft? Or how, how much of the connectivity that you provide your employees is part of that MPLS network? Um, in number of sites, it's probably about 80%. If it's in traffic, obviously the, the backbone transports much more traffic, but that's irrelevant. Right? Oh, it's probably about 80%. Is it's MPLS carrier networks? Yeah, across the globe. Yeah. <coughs> now, <coughs> explain a little bit of, of about the WAN carriage by the carrier networks and the WAN carriage by your own backbone. And how, how does that work? In, for, us as a, well, for us as an enterprise IT team, it's actually, it's actually transparent to us because we just, have, we just get connectivity. We do BGP peering with Azure or we do BGP peering with our carriers. And actually what is in the back of that as an IT organization, as an IT support team, we don't really see much difference there, right? Of course, okay. it has advantages for us to be on the Azure network because of the capacity they are for us. They don't limit any port speeds on the backbone, but that's just because we have, it's, it's, yeah, because we have the same company and it's all monopoly money between the two organizations. Yeah. Um, but from a <coughs> practical perspective, it's just as another carrier to us. How much insight do you have into whether traffic is migrating from the MPLS carrier networks to your own private backbone? How much insight do you have to that? Or can you speak to that? No, no, really. I don't, ha I don't have much insights in that myself. It's possible that the carrier strategy team actually can talk about that. But I don't have much insights in, in those specific figures. OK. So. All right. Um, what, what can you cite in the way of sort of changes, strategic initiatives that you're undergoing that we could put into the, into the bucket of some form of network transformation? Yeah, so um, we started a initiative that was called Internet First in a couple of years ago about the idea probably founded two and a half, three years ago. And the idea was really that, look, if I'm based, and I, I, I take the example of South Africa, let's say I'm an employee, I'm based in Cape Town, if I want to access something in the cloud, I need to actually transport all the way up my packets to Dublin because that's where the internet breakout is. Oh, in Ireland. South Africa, yes, in Ireland. With a backup to London. I break out to the internet, I go into Azure, I go find my documents. It can be another cloud provider too, it doesn't really matter which cloud provider. Then I have to bring that back to Dublin, I have to transport it all the way back down to Cape Town. So that's actually, you tr and that at the same point in time that the mailbox of that person can be local to where he's based, right? So it's just not logical, but it could be. So actually we at least two times long hauling all those packets across the globe. So we looked at that and said, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Now, Microsoft as a company has been also been promoting the cloud first, mobile first um, paradigm. So that also means we try to migrate as much of the applications as we can into the cloud, right? So typical example is Office. Everybody uses that, everybody, well, not everybody, a lot of people uh, use it and everybody knows that. So when you look at that, it makes much more sense to give a local internet breakout to that office in Johannesburg on Cape Town and say, look, your account is actually home in South Africa. You break out locally on the internet. You go get your information there and you take it back without long hauling all the traffic two times around the globe. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. That started, like I said, about two and a half, two years ago. Um, 
that has a little bit evolved into something that is more known as zero trust networking by now. Um, so for people that have been following that area, I think it's, it's actually not, it's not completely new, it's not groundbreaking. So Google has published some documentation, I think it was about 2014, around the time that I joined Microsoft, about Beyond Corp, so Beyond CorpNet. For people that read it, it's kind of the same principle. Um, so it's mainly driven from a security perspective. Because if I look at the network that we had before, I mean, actually, I can walk in, and I'm, I'm a knowledge worker, like we call it. I'm somebody that can, I can sit at home, I can sit in a hotel, I can connect to the Wi-Fi here, I can go sit in an office, I can do my job from literally anywhere where I have an internet connection, so I don't need anything more than that. Um, but on the other hand, if I go into the office, I connect to the network, I can actually access HR systems, finance systems, I can attack DNS servers all day long or DHP scopes. Nothing really prevented me initially from doing that. So, and there's no reason why, to give one example, somebody like me would need access to a DNS server except for UDP and TCP port 53 to resolve a name. And so the idea is that you take your users, you put them on a segment, a separate segment of your network, and that's we, that used, we used to call the internet first, now we call it our inter INET, so internet network. And from there, your user has to use other means of getting to the application that you need to go. So that internet segment allows you access to all your cloud-based application that you can access via public internet. But it means that I no longer have access to all these systems that I'm not supposed to have access to. Right? So if I sit on an internet connection inside an office, I don't have access to HR systems that I have nothing to see with, but I only have access to the internet. And if I need to access some specific applications that I need to do my job, I will have to VPN in today. Right? So today it's a VPN connection. Um, so we had to really beef up our VPN connectivity. In the future, the goal is that we're gonna work on like an application gateway or an application proxy. That means we publish all of our applications out on the internet 100% is probably going to be a little bit wishful thinking, um, but the majority of the applications will be in Azure Public Cloud. They will be published to, uh, with a public DNS result, a DNS resolvable name. And then we will use other authentication mechanisms to get access to the applications that you need to have access to. So identity is kind of moving from, well, no, the, the, the authentication is going to be identity based. It's going to be who you, like who you are, what certificates you have on your machine. So it's gonna be machine and user authentication. And via an intelligent proxy <coughs> application gateway, you will be able to access the devices or the applications that you need to have access to. Right? So that's definitely been one of the major initiatives. Um, together with that comes also more network segmentation because obviously there is the internet network, but there's also things like there's an infrastructure administration network. Like we need to have access to our gear, right? If something breaks, we need to get access to it. Before, unfortunately, you can do it via any connection that you find in the office, which is not what we want because anybody can attack our network today or could attack our network uh, initially. Uh, we have some IoT separate segmentation, uh, critical IoT, which is very different from IoT um, there. And, there's, and obviously, there's gonna, still going to be some engineering segmentation too. So we have certain workloads that we cannot move to the internet or to the plain internet uh, for sometimes it can be security reasons, right? Licensing, for example, for mm -hmm. solutions is one of the reasons. Certain engineering workloads cannot move to the internet for security reasons. Um, there's also certain solutions that just don't work, right? So when we started to look into how, how do we do this in a, in a sales office, you go to a sales office, you bring them an internet connection, you're like, okay, now you have to do your job. There's certain things like, emergency calling, E911 calling for certain regions and countries that have issues with that. And obviously, we drag along probably 20 years of legacy of conference room infrastructure and, and other like line batch readers, line yard readers that just simply don't work today over the internet. So we kind of need to bring all the owners of the applications and so along and say, look, you need to make sure that you can access your stuff from the internet and that you, the users that need it can also access it from the internet. And that's, that's been proven to be difficult. That's also why I said we are expanding the internet connectivity. Today we have not removed any of the real MPLS connectivity or the private connectivity um, because of those specific workloads that cannot move to the internet yet. But that is the goal. So when you have a, 
a device that does not work over the internet, how does the device know what the transport mechanism is? It's, it's separate VRF, so very simple. So we, we all, if you look at the, the model of network segmentation that we're looking at, it's actually going to be one VRF per segment. Right? And that's actually, it's, it's going to be a logical separation. And there's, for security reasons, and obviously, um, there's a separate security team that has sometimes very conflicting wishes than we have, uh, but they do not allow any leakage between the different VRFs. Uh -huh. So it's actually a very separate uh, segment of the network at that point in time. Okay. And did I hear you say something about the uh, workloads or applications that go into the cloud, some of which are on Azure, meaning do you use other cloud services? Uh, no, we don't use other cloud services, but we still have quite some applications that are not quite. We, I think 97% 90, of the IT-owned applications are publicly available but we still have some applications that are private. And those private applications typically sit or in the on-prem data centers, or they okay, sit okay. Uh, behind Express Route in the like extension of a corpnet, right? Express Route's kind of the private connectivity into Azure. We're trying to limit that to as little as possible, um, but for certain things, we still sit on that private connectivity. Okay. Yeah. So as, as we get into more about network transformation, can you talk a little bit about <clears throat> how uh, you're seeing that from the point of view of the carriers, if at all, versus what you're doing internally to sort of undergo a network transformation. So if, so from, let's say from a carrier perspective today, there nothing has been changed, right? So the goal is obviously over time that if we look at, at those, and I would call them sales marketing offices, right? We, or not, we, Typically, we'd call them knowledge workers. Those are the people, like I said, can travel around, work from anywhere. We are actually, at this point in time, pretty much convinced they don't need anything better than a plain internet connection, right? So we had, today, we have 22 sites deployed, and it's a very small number. I do agree over that long course of, the, course of time, and I can explain why, or I can tell why. Um, of those sites, we put all the users on the internet-only segment, and actually, the user experience has been great. And the more, emer if you go to more like the emerging regions, and I go, go back to the example of South Africa, we had, we had been doing some testings and we've seen that like some of the connectivity at the speed of accessing information has been improved eight times, right? So opening a document, for example, or connecting to some services would be eight times faster when you have a local breakout, right? So okay, I was so in that, that was wondering where the speed improvement came from. The speed improvement comes exactly from just putting somebody to work from the internet instead of put somebody to work from a corporate connectivity. Yep. Right? And I do have to be honest too, we use today, or we have focused initially on DIA, like dedicated internet access. So we go to some of the people in the room here, we ask them like, look, can you provide us an internet connection, at premium quality, and do you have a direct pairing with Azure? Right? Because you know this, but I've been, my main responsibility has been around voice and video in the past, so I've been actually one of the architects being really concerned about this, because we all know that yeah. voice is typically not behaving very well over in, well, variable delay network, right? The generate jitter, the packet loss, delay, all those kind of things. Now, we have extensive monitoring in place for that, and we noticed that in those 22 sites where we did this, actually the user experience has been amazingly good much better than really? I expected, and there has been <coughs> no thoughts about rolling that back whatsoever. Right? So it, it has improved the user experience, it has not saved us money today. Right? And the primary objective from doing this network, this transformation is, for us, was to improve the security, to improve the user experience. We hope, obviously, just like everybody, we, want, we try to be agile, right? We, 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 we tried to save some money, but it's not a prime. It's, it wasn't the primary objective, and it has proven not to be the case to date because we're still in that transformation progress mm -hmm. process. Now, you have mentioned the improvements uh, for the internet-only <coughs> uh, access for people. Um, is that just because the corporate network is so convoluted, and you keep having to go these long distances to these different gateway and meeting points? Is yes. there some other explanation? No, I think exactly, it's, it, that's mostly what it is. So it is the long connectivity. Also, we have to be honest, we had some very, 
I would call it productive discussions with our security team, because obviously if you go to a localized internet connection, we have about 14 of those around the world, internet breakouts, centralized. So you have the distance, but also there's a complete edge with like high security logging, a lot of monitoring in place, so that actually slows it down a little bit too. If I work from home or work from here or work from my hotel, actually that security posture is not there neither. Their argument obviously is like, well, the attack vector, if you sit in an office, is higher or there's more risk, but it's, it's more leaner. We just, we use the existing equipment. We put an ankle, an ankle on it, so we put a stateful firewall on top of that, that router that was there, and that's the only thing we have there that allows you in and out. Because there's no services that get published, published from those segments, in fact. So it's a lean connection. It's probably not the cheapest internet that you can find, and then you really minimize the distance there. Mm -hmm. Because the cloud, with microservices, etc., the cloud, the services that you're looking for will actually show up in the region that you need them. So that makes that the response, it's much more responsive than if, if you have to follow the traditional paths. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how is this notion of network transformation changing the role of Microsoft IT? So that's actually a good question. So obviously the, when you first bring up these ideas a couple of years ago, you got half the team getting getting worried they're going to lose their job, everybody's just going to sit on the internet, work from Starbucks, we all have to go home. Well, that has actually been proven not to be the case, right? So just like, I guess, most organizations, we've only been more busy and more things to do, but there is a little shift in focus, right? So the, the, the emphasis is moving from, from one, I would say, skill to another skill. So the on-premise data centers, for example, they've gone from 11 to 5 in their shrink in size. We still have some very good data center engineers, and we need them because, like I mentioned before, there's certain things we have to publish locally on premise. Um, so, but obviously, if, if you think that team's gonna triple in size, that's not gonna happen, right? Also, we've seen people moving from wired skills to wireless skills, right? Because typically, in, in internet-first connectivity, we only have wireless connectivity, and that's just been driven by the users, right? We, we had, sites with five, 600 ports, of which maximum 20 of those were used at a certain point in time, at, at the max peak utilization. So that means all the equipment sits there, cooling, power, maintenance, MNR, or uh, patching everything you want, and nobody is using it. So I see it more as a shift in roles, but then also because the segmentation, there's a whole lot of <coughs> new work that came with deploying new segments in the network. I mean, there's a whole lot of things with conditional access, because by default, anybody coming into the office right now is going to go on the internet. That's the goal. We don't have it everywhere, but that's actually the goal that the user is going to do. It's forced in certain locations. It's not forced everywhere. But if you are the owner of a conferencing system, we're going to enforce you on 802.1x. We're going to enforce you on telling us who you are and why you need something else than that default internet connection. So that's an area where we have a lot of projects, a lot of people going on. Um, there are other things. Um, let's say the, or from an automation perspective, right? So I mentioned before, we were actually a bunch of very good keyboard jockeys, but right now we, we not, well not, I don't say we fully automated, but we definitely, we're using Ansible, we're using Ansible Tower, um, so we're kind of more in the, in the programming uh, side of the house too. Um, the monitoring is much more important, and that's also because we're changing the infrastructure. So if, if, I'm have, if I have to access for today and, uh, one of the um, applications that sits on Quadnet is actually going to be more difficult because I now sit on the internet. I need to go to one of my VPN concentrators via hopefully the right GeoDNS location. I need to get into the network. Maybe I need to go to another site where that application is home. And if I'm really unlucky, I have to go to Express rather than I have to access the Azure private cloud. So that becomes a really long path. So that's why we build new solutions for monitoring statistics, all analyzing, uh, all those kind of things. So I think that for us, the job has not really changed. I see it more that there's a shift in focus and there's actually more things that we have to do than that we did in the past, in my opinion. So it, how is this change in the skill sets required in Microsoft IT? So I think we, it, it changed because everybody kind of needs to get into the programming world the past year. So we, like I said, it's, for us the choice was, and I'm not saying it's the best choice, it, for us it seems to be the best choice at that point in time. 
as Ansible, Ansible Tower as a, as a management frame around that. So we had to send our engineers to software skills. Everybody knows a little bit of Python these days. Um, while before most people were PGP experts, right? Or were mm -hmm. like other experts in certain areas. Also, we <coughs> adopted the, uh, the DevOps model um, because that, well, that's just a generic thing, I guess. Um, so, but for the rest, I guess if you talk about the IT people, some of them, like I said, had to change, but that's the, the changes are minimal for certain areas, like people that work in security, people that work on the edges, people that work on the backbone, that actually hasn't changed much. If you talk about the end users, so the, the, our customers actually, the people that are using our services, for them some things might have changed, but I don't know if that's your question or not. Well, I was going to get in, into any impact on your end users, either in terms of the ease of doing their job or the skills they have to have, or freedom or constraints for how they do their job, given the changes in Microsoft IT. Mm. So I think we can categorize the, the users in, in certain groups. So if I look at the knowledge workers, like, we, like I said, the people that just travel around, typical sales guys, marketing people, or training guys, um, for them, actually, not much has changed. I think most of them don't notice what's happening. Um, so they walk into an office via, um, via Intune or via SEC, and we kind of push them a new certificate. We kind of make sure that they connect to the new MSFT iNet, so the internet segment of the network. and VPN is there, it will automatically connect if necessary. We hopefully that goes away over time, but it's still there today. So for them, not much has changed. Of course, we send them these nice emails and all those kind of things that nobody reads, right? So you, people show up in the office, mm. and nobody, these guys, I don't know what they do, but they don't read emails, that's for sure. <laughs> so you need to make sure that that's transparent, right? Because that just never happens. Mm -hmm. um, for the engineering community, which is still 40% of our users, it is actually quite, it can be impacting because those guys typically used to have a laptop and they have this big hunking machine under the desk and they connect to that machine directly. Yeah. Now you put their laptop on, on, on the internet, they, oh, then they're gonna go the same path that I just described. They're gonna have to go to the internet, they're gonna have to VPN in, they're gonna have to find a way back to that machine. Um, and then from the moment we force it, actually that machine is gonna be disconnected. So they, we need to explain them like, look, this is the 21st century. We kind of gonna move this stuff away from you. We're gonna move it or in a managed lab environment because labs are actually pretty critical. Initially I was thinking, well, it's only a lab, but labs are used to like simulate customer issues, customer scenarios, so they, they have a five, nine uptime, so we cannot really play with those. So we still have on-premise labs, and then a lot of the labs and the testing happens in the cloud these days. And that's what we're trying to bring engineering along to, to kind of on their journey. Because they used to like, have all these machines around them with direct connectivity. Some of them take a switch. We, of course, don't, you can't prevent it, but we cannot prevent people from doing their job. So put like a little hub under the desk, put all this. Mm -hmm. I mean, those things happens all, happen all the time. So those people are really impacted. And that's not easy to bring them along. So because they're like, why I need to change? I did it for 20 years, working great. You're kind of taking this away from me. How many of these uh, sort of technical workers, these programmers, are not resident in Redmond? So I think the majority, and I don't have the exact figure, um, I think it's about 75 to 80% is resident in Redmond, and all these pe other people are remote. Mm -hmm. But then typically what we see, and I, I can give the example of Brussels where I'm based in Belgium, these guys work a lot from home, but still in the office they have those machines sitting under the desk, so it's the same problem. Oh. So it's, uh, and those are sales officers, so we're not so nice with them as we are with the Redmond crew. <laughs> that's where all, the majority is, they, with a lot of them over there. Uh -huh. So that's, yeah, that's, that, that is challenging, and for them it's challenging too. And I understand that their job is to develop something or to do something, and we kind of coming in the middle, they're, no, 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 now you have to change. It's like, oh, wait a minute, you prevent me from doing my job. And so that, those become very interesting discussions. So uh, I hear uh, enterprises talk more and more about outsourcing IT. They're outsourcing a lot of things, mm -hmm. uh, getting out of those responsibilities. Uh, how much do you see that happening in, in Microsoft? So what, in Microsoft, actually, we have um, given out a lot of the deployments. And actually, we're trying to pull a lot of that back in-house with automation. So we have, had, we have used a lot of the um, 
TCS people, and they've done awesome jobs in deploying officers mm -hmm. and upgrading and doing those things. And we still use them today. Even for Internet First Rollout, we used a lot of those resources to upgrade sites and to make sure that the VRFs gets in place, etc. But we kind of hope that with automation we can prevent that because, I mean, everybody in this audience knows that automation is always a better deal than people, and it has nothing to see with being outsourced, yes or no. Um, but like design operations is also mostly done. In the DevOps model, we kind of pull back all the support internally too. There is still a front line, but we have uh, more support people internally than we used to have a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. How do you see automation affecting your job in the next five years? Ooh, that's, uh, in, in, in for me as a network architect, and I'm not really the person doing a lot of the operational work. So for me, it's not that big of an impact. Um, I think for the, uh, the, 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 the people that are designing or do more of the implementations, for them, they become more coders than they are network engineers today. But still, actually, we are convinced that every network engineer needs to learn how to code, and not every coder needs to know how to do network designs. Because mm -hmm. it's great to have a good programmer, but if you, you cannot replace your networking team by a bunch of coders because they don't know how to do networking with all respect, but that's just how it is. So I think over the coming five years, we'll see more people getting in, into software skills, but those will be the, the networking engineers that we have in place today. That's our goal. Mm -hmm. So you think that that's, it's trainable in that direction? Yes. We think it's trainable. We've seen pretty good success so far. It can, of course, always it can go, it can go faster, right? Everybody wants to go more fast, um, but it's, it's definitely doable. Mm -hmm. how, how useful are any of the mechanisms and tools we've talked about the last three days in terms of network transformation, automation, and orchestration? Uh, how useful are they to Microsoft IT? So I think it's, I've been listening very, um, should I say, with a lot of interest to all the things that we want to speed up the delivery of services to us. Because I'm going to give you one example that's typical, that's very actual in our network transformation. I mentioned we did 22 sites over almost two years with internet first connectivity. The main blocker there has been that it takes forever to get that internet circuit delivered to us. Right? So it, it mm -hmm. became so bad that security was yelling at us, the leadership team of my leadership team was yelling at us and saying, you need to move faster, that is not working because you're putting the company at risk. So we decided after those, and that's why I said 22 sites, we have 512 offices. We enable the offices now in a, what would I say, with a dirty hack. So we kind of created a separate SSID, a separate VRF in all our offices that is internet only. We transport them back to our regionalized internet breakouts and we break them out on the internet there. And that's actually the way, using some TCS, using some outsourced resources, to kind of get this done in, the, in a couple of months. We struggled for two years trying to get 22 internet circuits delivered to us, and now that, that just doesn't work. If we need to do that in 500 sites, we are extremely at risk, and that's something that we didn't want to, that risk we didn't want to take. My, LT, my leadership team didn't want to take that risk. Mm -hmm. So we kind of used the existing infrastructure as the breakout model for internet connectivity. And now, once that's done, that's hopefully be done by the end of the fiscal, we're gonna go back and we're gonna look at, hey, what are we gonna do next? Now we have to look at sites, for example, that go beyond, let's say, 50 milliseconds till the breakout point. Those sites, how are we gonna handle them? How are we gonna treat them better so that these people get a better user experience? Right? And that's actually why I'm very interested in some of the stuff MEF is doing. Um, as you know, I'm very, I'm very much I think a lot of the intent-based networking is something that can help us in the future, right? And then I know the gentleman from Forward Networks, the CTO, talked about intent-based in a certain way. If we talk from an enterprise perspective about intent-based networking, it's more that we have a certain application that we want to prioritize in certain regions. So far, it has been proven to be good, but at a certain point in time, there's going to be something that, has, that needs priority. Till we get an easy way to signal, to flag that to our carriers that, hey, here is a flow that we want to dynamically prioritize on the network that we can send in, in a, to a control plane via a northbound interface. I think to that point in time, we'll be focusing just on internet connectivity mm -hmm. because the plain internet connectivity without any additional stuff, just a simple uh, stateful firewall in front of it that we have in place today has proven to be enough for the user community. Right? 
So once we go, and that's also, I'm not a very big fan of some of the SD-WAN um, applications. But if you can go into an SD-WAN solution, you can add additional services on top <coughs> of it. That's when it starts to become interesting, like security as a service, which is also something that we are working on in MEF. That's when it becomes interesting, just SD-WAN for application prioritization. I don't think I need that today. I don't mm -hmm. think as an enterprise, if you have some decent internet connection, that's enough for all the applications that we're using today. And that includes voice and video and pretty extensively, as I gave you the figures when we started yeah. the conversation. Do you see bandwidth needs changing much or not? Bandwidth needs are actually skyrocketing, right? So we see bandwidth needs are ever growing, right? So and we have we are more or less in a luxury position that in the backbone we just we call we call our good friends from Azure. We say, can you make that a 10 gig instead of a one gig? We say, sure. It's done, right? So that makes it easy for us. And that, that's, that's, that's not a realistic picture. We do understand that. But also in, in some of the remote sales offices, we see actually things like people putting 4K cameras, 4K monitors, you start to do video conference calls. So that's actually what pumps up the bandwidth requirements tremendously. I think mm -hmm. email, documentations, SharePoints, I mean, yeah, do, do I care if my email shows up two seconds later in the morning or if I open the document one second later? And that's extremely long, right? Most mm -hmm. more about a couple hundred seconds. I don't. As long as I can make a decent conversation with my customer, as long as I can do a decent conference call with my peers, that's actually okay. Right? Of course, there are scenarios, and we had those in the past, mostly when we were between like OF sites, outside facilities, developing code for Microsoft, trying to transfer 20, 30, 40 gig images back to the mothership in Redmond. That has been challenging, and that is still challenging today. But that's one of those reasons we go back to engineering and say, can you please change the way you work? Because this is not how it's supposed to be done. Like sending from this machine on the network to that machine on the network 50 gig, uh, yeah, that's gonna be problematic and that will always be problematic. Mm -hmm. For the regular user, yes, we see a growth in bandwidth, mainly due to video and cameras and stuff, um, but it's doable. I mean, I think we do have, even for sales offices, the. Minimum connectivity is about 200 meg, 300 meg. Mm -hmm. Most of them are higher than that. So typically, with 500, 600 meg is where it starts and up for mm -hmm. our connectivity. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Questions from the audience before we wrap up? Vishal, we'll get a microphone to you. Yeah, good. Uh, so you talked about the difficulty, obviously, of getting those 22 connections over two years. But uh, what about sort of starting out, and, and this was proposed as one of the options and, and comes up naturally, is maybe with a, you know, some kind of a wireless broadband connection that's a lot faster maybe to set up and then you know, do the internet. Now, of course, if it still takes two years, that's too long for a wireless broadband, but, yeah. but why wouldn't that be an option? So as I said, I was really concerned about uh, voice and video experience because of mm. We did it in sales offices, right? Those people live on their phone and live on their conference calls all day long. And I was really concerned about latency, jitter, packet loss, these kind of scenarios. So we said, well, let's not take, we, it's kind of, for us it was kind of a big change because it was the first time we did it. Um, so we kind of tried to limit the risk by going with those uh, dedicated internet access. Understood, DIA. thanks. And that's why we did it and that's probably why it took a little bit longer too. I don't. I'm not bashing anybody in this room because it was the same in all the continents we did it, so it's sure. probably just a given. Maybe it's also partially due to some of the internal procedures. I don't want to say no. So it's, it's, but the fact for life is it took us two years and we got told like, this is not working. Move away from this. Especially if you have 500 more to go. We have 500 yeah. more to go, right? So. We also have a, let's just jump into this question. It's also about DIA that came over Slido. You indicated the quality of DIA is acceptable. Typically, it still requires a local loop, so savings over MPLS VPN is less. Will 5G replace local access? That's actually a good point. And if you remember, I said the, the goal is not to save cost. We think that approximately, and I, you guys know this figures better than I do. When I talk to the carrier strategies team internally, they think that 70 to 80% of the cost is the local loop, right? So savings, no, that's not the goal. User experience, improved security, that's really the goal. Uh, will 5G replace local access? That is something that we will probably be testing. Um, we've been not very successful with shared media in the past, but obviously things are changing, so we're definitely interested to look into that. We haven't done anything today. 
All right, one more question, Alan. For, for clarification, DIA, Internet First, that's the same thing, right? And for it, us, it's the same thing. And, and, and what I understand it to be from inference is simply a wireline connection from the Internet point of presence to the Microsoft office, central faci Correct. facility. Correct. Okay, so back to the 22. Why did it take so long? Was, were new circuits have to be installed? And was it at the speeds you're talking about, I think you could get it over bonded DSL, did you need fiber? Why did it take so long? Why are you struggling for I don't uh, know. two years with 22 circuits uh, unless they, they're, they're, it doesn't exist any copper? I, I actually, I cannot tell you. So this our carrier team has been driving it. I wish I could tell you or give a better explanation. But it just, it's, it's a lot of issues. I mean, indeed, some of them had to, had to pull fibers in. Some of them had to put cabling in. Some of the, some of the sites were like, oh, we have MPLS today. We, there's apparently, and I wasn't aware of that, certain regulatory compliance where you have MPLS and uh, like internet for the same carrier, the same location is not possible. So you need to change. But your internet first is just plain internet, as I understand. It's it. plain internet. There's nothing else. It's plain internet. Now, we, do, we did ask them, we did go initially with the, the carriers that, had direct peering into Azure because of our quality of service experience, the quality of experience. So you don't, you don't know how many new circuits had to be put in or whether it was just no, I don't. a delay uh, getting the internet provisioned over existing copper line facilities that already were going to your buildings? You don't no, know? I, don't, I don't know the details of that, to be honest. All right, I think we have uh, used up our time. Thank you, yes. Garrett, for the enlightenment about the journey okay. that you're Welcome. taking on the enterprise side. Thank you.